I think we can get started with uh, the last talk for today before the panel. It's Giovanni on real-time data-driven application using Python and Pandas. It's kind of hard though when they squeeze you between a talk spying with Python and a German beer, but I'll try to do my best to, to make it worth it. My name is Giovanni Lanzani. I am a data whisperer at uh, Go Data Driven, a small consultancy firm in the Netherlands. And the talk is about real-time data-driven application using Python and Pandas as backend. And a bit of info about me. Uh, I was born in Italy, then I moved to the Netherlands for love. My wife was there. Uh, okay. I did a PhD in theoretical physics there. There I fell in love with uh, Python and NumPy. The work was on DNA mechanics. Then I went from, for one year at KPMG. For the one that know KPMG, you can imagine those were my Python dark months in the sense that I didn't do any Python. And then to continue with the analogy, I had my Python renaissance when I went to go to the driven. And this talk is about a project that uh, we did for one of our clients. Uh, by the way, you can direct snarky feedback live while I talk to my Twitter handle. My wife and colleagues will thank you later. And. Uh, I will give the email at the end of the talk for even snarkier comments, if you don't want them to be public. So, what, is a, what do I mean by real-time data-driven app? Uh, mostly, well, I think almost all apps that we use every day, think about Instagram, our password manager, we store data and we retrieve it. Especially with my password manager, I don't expect it to mess with the data they put there. Uh, a data-driven app, on the other hand, could have a permutation of transform and reach and analyze phases between when I store the data and when I retrieve it. That is, in my opinion, what, what makes a data-driven app. And real-time is where at least the retrieve phase is not, is not a batch process. I'm speaking about latency not higher than one to two seconds for most queries. If it's above that, I start to go into the batch realm. And an app means something your mother could use. She doesn't need to understand what she's doing, but she should be able to use it. So if she has to type in some uh, SQL code, that's probably not an app in my, in my view. So what is this app about? Uh, a client of, of ours in the Netherlands asked us, can we get insights about the impact of an event? So the data that they gave us were the server logs of an application that they, that they have, where people can get online, type the name of an activity, of a shop, of a restaurant in the Netherlands, and get some basic information like phone number, openings time if available. And I said, this is the data that we, that we have. Try to make something by, through which we can detect if an event has happened and what was the, uh, what was the impact of, it, of this event. And the app that we built is kind of basic. We can insert a postal code. Uh, it's, simple, it's simply a zip code in the Netherlands. It's composed of six characters, four uh, numbers and two letters. Then a range in kilometers. So this is 10 kilometers from the center of Amsterdam. And then we can put two day, uh, well, a date range. This is the day before Queen's Day last year and Queen's Day this year, or the one. King's Day. Well, I think last year was still Queen's Day. This year is King's Day. It's Dutch, they, they, they always mess around with, uh, with vacations. Um, so you, you put, you put uh, the, uh, a day that you want, a date range, and then you say, I want to compare it with a week before, for example, assuming that the week before was a normal week. What you get, it's, uh, well, I, 
cut and paste the UI. Uh, I couldn't show the, the, the app that we built, not because they don't trust you, but because they don't trust me, so don't take it personal. I do. Um, and what you get, it's, uh, first it's a map, in this case of Amsterdam, and when you, ha when you have a blue region, that means that there, there is an activity that received less hits, so less people clicked on that, on that activity that is located there with respect to one week before. When you see some red, you see an activity that has been clicked more with respect to one week before. Besides that, you get a timeline. This is the time of these two days. In dark blue, you see the hit or the visit for the day before Queen's Day. So you see everybody was searching where should I drink beer tomorrow. And then Queen's Day itself, everybody was drinking beer, so nobody was using the app compared to one week before, which is the light curve, which, remain, which remains more or less stable among two days. Besides that, we get a division by category we have a top category, bars and restaurants. We have many more, health, consultancy, fisheries, agriculture. How many hits it got and the percentage variation compared to the previous week. And then we have some categories. So each category has subcategories and you get the same statistics for, for each subcategory. The, the very first question that we always get at is, is it big data? Is it not just a label that you apply to yourself to ask for higher consultancy fees? Uh, well, most of the time it's not, but in this particular case, I believe it is. The total log files that you, you were given are on the order of 40 terabytes. Uh, it's a couple of years of, uh, of logs, and we use Hadoop to store and reach and pre-process the data. And for the one interested, we have a 10 nodes Hadoop plus Cloudera Manager and a, and a job tracker, test tracker with about 24 terabytes of storage per node. And it's just a, to, to give you an idea. So what are the challenges to build such an app? The first one, at least in Europe, we just heard that in, in the US is not quite the same, is privacy. So how can we, well, store and process this data while having privacy taken care of? The second is that it's a huge pile of data if you want to do some real-time retrieval. On top of real-time retrieval, we would also like to do some real-time analysis because as we saw, we can insert a range in our application and while this range changes, what is shown on the table, on the, on the app is different. So when I see the percentage, this percentage changes with the radius because the amount of activity that fall within that radius changes. I can also change postcode and that's the same, that's the same story. So privacy, for the one of you that uh, worked with privacy before, you have to have to speak with lawyers and human resources and whatnot. It can really be a curse, but it's also a gift, at least in our case. Uh, why is it a gift? Because you have to trim a lot of information that either you don't want to use or you cannot use, and you have to group this information. So to get to a certain level of granularity, to be able not to identify anybody using the app. Thanks to privacy, what we did was to aggregate all the hits by the hour. So all the hits are aggregated on an hour level. So every activity has its number of hits in, a, in an hour, not on the minute or second. And that brought the data from 40 terabytes to approximately half terabyte, which is not any more big data, but we didn't change our fees because of that. It's, it's true. <laughs> um, 
half a terabyte, terabytes still classify as large data. It's not big anymore. We didn't do Hadoop after, after the reduction, but it's still, it can still offer some, uh, some challenges. So the third one was the real-time retrieval, uh, which is kind of harder than it looks because we have geographical data, as I said before. So when you have geographical data and you put things in a database, you don't have a nice index, which is sequential, but you get points on a, well, on a sphere or on a 2D plane, which is way harder to, to retrieve. And for the real-time analysis, we just use a golden-tailed tree shrew or something like that uh, in the basement. No, I'm kidding. This is the logo of the Python for Data Analysis book by Wes McKinney. So we use Pandas by Wes McKinney to do all the real-time analysis. And for the one not familiar with Pandas, uh, it's a very powerful library that uh, under the hood uses NumPy, and NumPy under the hood uses C. So when you, if you do things cleverly with Pandas, you get C-like speed with your application, and uh, that means that real-time analysis can be done. We'll see more about it in a moment. So what about the architecture of this application? So we have a front-end part, some JavaScript, uh, written using AngularJS, a famous JavaScript framework, that runs in the browser. This application makes some REST, HTTP REST calls to a Flask Python application. We'll see in a bit what a Flask app is. This Flask application uses a helper module to answer the query of the, of the front end, and it gives back some JSON that then AngularJS processes and it shows it to the, to, to the end user. Before continuing, let me tell you that I know how much Python developers love JavaScript, so I just have two slides in JavaScript, nothing more. If you don't like JavaScript, you can just black out for a moment. So this is the first and the second. Okay, that was it. Now to the cool stuff, this is Flask. Uh, what is Flask? So Flask is the thing that actually answered to this, to the AngularJS making the calls, and it's a simple yet very powerful uh, Python framework. Uh, to use it, it's extremely simple. You just import Flask, and then you define an app route, which is basically the address that you put in the address bar. And you, we're telling this Flask application, when the user goes to slash hello, just give back hello world. So if I run this application, this is actually working code, I can just go to localhost hello, and I'm greeted by hello world. So this is the thing that, well, that, that served as backend. Of course, it was more complicated in our case. So in this, uh, this is an example where we have an API. I can give some arguments, so the postal code, the date range, and the radius as an optional argument. And what the Flask application will do, it will call the getJSON function in the helper module and give us back some st statistics, some, the timeline, and the data points and it will then return them. So let's analyze this getJSON function. Oh, no, before, let's see what the data looks like in this reduced form. We have a column for the date, so for example, it is the 8th of January. Then we have an hour, because everything is aggregated by hour. Then we have an activity ID, a postal code. Then the hit it's received on this particular hour on this particular day. Then we have a delta column that's, that are the hits that it received one week before. So you see the date offset is seven days. And then the SBI is a sector code. So in this case, SBI one. But then we could have another activity which has another sector code. So 
when I say the data and this application think about something like this in the database, although not exactly like this. So this helper that, uh, that get the JSON uh, looks a bit like this. We'll, uh, we'll work backwards to see how it works. So at the end, it returns what it gathered. Before doing that, it computes the statistics and the timeline using data. Data is, in this case, a pandas data frame that we got in the previous step. I will look at that in a, in a minute. The get statistic function takes this data data frame, then it takes a sector code, and the first thing that it does, it filters the data frame by the sector code. If somebody has any question throughout the code, code just uh, raise your hand or throw something at the, at the stage. Afterwards, I will sum the hits for that particular data frame. And here I'd like to point out that when this function gets the data, this data is already filtered by date and by location. So we already have the right data. So the data for the geographical location that we want and a particular date that we want. So it gets all the hits for that, look, for that region in that date, and it gets the delta hits. And that is the, the, the hits a week before. At the end of that, it computes a percentage, the percentage change that we saw before, and it displays this in the user interface. So we see that for this particular sector code, we had 260,000 hits with an increase of 26% with respect to one week before. And it does so with all the SBI, all the codes, sector code. And the list is, of course, longer. Then we have the get timeline function, uh, which does, well, basically it does a group by, another group by. In our pre-processing, we did a group by date, hour, an activity. Now we don't want to, here we don't want to group our activity, we want to get every activity in a certain sector. So we group by date, by hour, and by, and by activity, and then we sum the number of hits and the delta hits. And the result is something like this. So this curve here that you see is the sum of all the activities in that region in those days. So the, so then here I actually get the data. So, and how does it work? In the first uh, iteration of the product, you kind of know how consultancy work. The client is kind of uh, skeptic about what we can do. So he says, okay, this is one week. This is the data. Let's see what, uh, what you can do. So in the first uh, iteration, we just had three gigabytes of data instead of half a terabyte. And what I did, uh, don't blame the team, I, I did it myself, was load all the data into a Pandas uh, data frame and put this actually out for the client to, to use. The funny, so you can see that we read the source data and then every time we have to get a certain subset we just filter the source data. The funny thing is that it actually worked and it was very fast because everything is kept in memory. And the advantage of, of this approach where everything is a data frame, so where you're actually using the data frame a bit like you would use a database, is that it's fast. You use what you know, so you don't have to write ugly SQL code in your, uh, in your app. You don't have database administrators. We all know we love them. And we all love CSVs, just simple files. There are, however, some disadvantages to this approach. And the first one is that it doesn't scale beyond memory. 
So when your data grows big enough, pandas cannot hold it anymore. Then you have huge startup time, because every time you start the app, it has to read the whole CSV file, and then it has to parse them eventually. Then you have no DBAs to point the finger to if something is wrong with the data. And we all hate CSVs sometimes, because they can, be, can also be difficult to, to work with. If you want to go down this path, uh, set the data frame index wisely. So in our case, we set the index of the data frame in the initial iteration to be an index by date. And then we aligned the data to the index so that dates the 1st of January were contiguous with date in the 2nd of January. Because now you use the app and you query the data, you're always querying contiguous days. And this speeds up the query system in, in Pandas by a factor of 10 or something, if you have a lot of, lots of data. And if you go down this path, beware of modification of the original data frame. You don't want to have function that modifies the data that you loaded. So always be careful with that. You also get some nice things. So for example, joins in data frame are super fast. And why are they fast? Uh, well, as you see, I took a screenshot when I was upvoting this answer. And the answer is that uh, Wes McKinney is a genius. And therefore, he wrote. <laughs> <laughs> and, and therefore, he wrote a very smart algorithm to do merges in, in Panda's data frame. As I said before, you should enjoy this moment of glory where I made you all laugh. Uh, as I said before, you don't have to go down this path. And in that case, what we did, we add an additional module, a database module, where we put all, uh, all database codes there. The database would then, uh, well, the database module would then interface with Postgres, Postgres through the Psycho PG2 package. And in the helper module, all we did was to change the API from this to this. So we added the database connection string, and that was it. <laughs> so we can, from here upwards, we didn't have to change anything, basically. Now, handling geographical data, what, we, what did we do? So when you enter a postcode, uh, you want to know a zip code, you want to know which zip code fall within the given radius from that center zip code. So in the Netherlands, we have approximately 400,000 zip code. It's a small country, but they like to categorize everything. So every three numbers in the street, you get a new zip code. And it really is true. It's a, and in Italy, we get 50,000 people per zip code, and in the Netherlands, maybe 15. So just to, to give you an idea. Uh, when you want to do such a kind of filter in pure Python, so you want to basically use the Heversign distance, which is the distance, which is the formula, the, the equation to get the distance between two points given latitude and longitude. Uh, in pure Python, uh, filtering 400,000 postcodes using that function takes 3,5 seconds or something like that, my MacBook Pro. This already puts the app outside the real time category of app that I spoke about before. So what we used here was again NumPy. So we did, uh, well, we just leveraged NumPy vectorize operation and NumPy can do the same query 160 times faster than pure Python. In this case, it's a huge, huge speed up. However, when you do such a query, and given that uh, the Netherlands has so many, so many postcodes, if you hash for the postcode within a 10 kilometer radius of Amsterdam, you get some 10,000 postcodes back, postal code. That means that uh, 
the SQL, the SQL that you'll have to write is select star from data point or select something from data point where the postcode should be into this giant array of 10,000 elements. So I don't know if this, well, we try with both MySQL and Postgres. Uh, the point is that the execution engine has to parse this, this huge query here. And just to do that, it takes a couple of minutes. Then it needs to fetch the data, and we would see queries that would run for 20 minutes just to get the data back. It was clearly unacceptable. So what we try to do first, you may be familiar with PostGIS. PostGIS is a Postgres extension to handle geographical data. So it allows you to do queries like this. Select everything from the data point where the position is within 1,500 meters of the reference latitude and reference longitude. It's, uh, the API is it's very clean. It's not very well documented, uh, postures in, 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 uh, in general, but uh, to do this query, it's very clean. You don't have to do fussy things. But there's a catch. With half a terabyte of data, the index, the geographical index that you need to put on latitude and longitude is half a terabyte. So the data is half a terabyte. The index, at least when you have uh, latitude and longitude to the seventh digit after the comma, is another half a terabyte. That means that just to build the index, you need a week, something like that, three, four days. It's really, really long. The other thing is that queries are very slow once the radius starts to grow. It has something to do with memory. If the index is too large for memory, Postgres tries to do other clever things, which don't end, don't end up to be very clever, because we had to discard this method at the end of the day. But if you have less data, PostGIS is a great addition to Postgres. So we had to find other solutions. So being very familiar with Hadoop, we tried a different, well, we explored other options. The first is Apache HBase, be the Hadoop database. But if you know a bit about HBase, it also works with sequential index indices. And so an index on a plane or on a sphere does not work for the way HBase is uh, um, structured. Impala, I don't know, how many of you know Impala? Yeah, one, two, three, okay. Good job, uh, Cloudera. Uh, Impala is a database developed by Cloudera, which uh, runs on top of, yeah, well, it's a query, SQL query engine, which runs on top of uh, Hadoop and uh, runs in memory, so it should be very, very fast, but it's not faster than Postgres when you have just half a terabyte of data. It, uh, you really see Impala shines when you do queries with uh, 3, 4, 10, 20 terabytes of data. Then another candidate, it's MongoDB. You know MongoDB has also native uh, support for geographical data. But what once we tuned the, the Postgres database, as I'll show you in the next slide, MongoDB turned out not to be so fast uh, as, uh, as they advertise. So, end of the story, we stayed with, uh, with Postgres and we did the following step. The first one is to align the data on disk by date. So once again, the date is our primary index in the table. And if you align the data by date, well, basically what the database does, it does sequential reads on the disk instead of doing random reads to get things that happen on the same day. This happened through the cluster keyword in Postgres. I suppose not many people know it because they chose probably the worst keyword ever to indicate that you want to align data on disk. Uh, but it's very powerful. This alone 
sped up our queries by, I think, more than an order of magnitude. The second trick is to use a temporary table to get the postcodes, the postal codes that we wanted. So I told you before that when you put a 10,000 items array in the query, the database execution engine kind of flips out. But if you put all those postcodes into a temporary table, uh, it's extremely fast to put them there. And then to filter your data points, you just do a join with this temporary table. In this way, the database engine doesn't have to parse all those 10,000 postcodes, but it just reads from the table. It's way more efficient. This also sped up things by three or four uh, X. So it helped a lot, but ultimately what we did was to lose some precision on the postal code. So if we go from six character postal codes to four character postal codes, we actually go from 400,000 postal codes to 10,000 maximum. And uh, at the end of the day, one, two, and three brought the queries from 20 minutes to maximum five or six seconds and for very large uh, ready and uh, for everyday use to milliseconds. Item number four, it's, uh, it's kind of uh, between bracket because it's a no-brainer. When you work with this kind of things, always compress the data flowing from the database to the application, to the Flask application, and from the Flask application to the front end, also compress the data. Because you, especially when it's, it begins to be big, bigger, so if you're trying to bring 40 megabytes from the Flask application to an iPad or something, it will probably need minutes on a mobile connection. And if you, if you compress it, instead of 40 megabytes, you get three or four megabytes. Way more manageable. And that was it. As everybody else, we're hiring. We're in the Netherlands where everybody speaks English and we use the metric system. So if you like English and the metric system, it's a great place to live. And <laughs> as promised, this is my email. And I will put the slides online somewhere today. So. Do you have any question? There's one in the front. Hi. Uh, thank you for the talk. Uh, can you go to the previous slide with the table? The, yes, this one. But if you have concurrent operations, how can you create every time a table with the same name? Is that the lock every time you, the app receives? We actually, we actually append a random number after the name of the table. Okay. And it's a temporary table, so every time we close the database connection, it, it gets deleted and it leaves in memory. Okay. So it's, uh, yeah. now I'm showing you raw CQ, but actually the CQ is called from a Python function inside yeah. the database module. Inside that function, we, we do, do every time a random number between one and a million or something. We create a table with, with a random name. We pass that random name to the following query. And then we close the database connection and the table is gone. Um, how I understood it, you have this RESTful API, and then you receive a call, and then you do the computations, and then you return the, the answer, right? Yeah. Isn't that a bit risky in general? I mean, you cannot really make sure that the computations always finish, and if they don't finish, you might really end up with no reply at all, or you might also risk maybe that um, people are just blocking your computing machines if you just receive, I don't know, 100 requests which, which take real long. Well, we don't have many uh, concurrent users as of now. And I think for the first question, you probably want something that, where is it? It's in one of these two slides. 
I mean, <laughs> JavaScript some, does some async things. So what we see is that the user interface is waiting for data to come in, and the various part of the user interface that is uh, these are being displayed are, as the data comes in. I mean, this is just uh, one, two, and three. The data comes with the same request, so they all are visualized at the same time. But I, we actually have more requests that, uh, that do some histograms and other things with the data that come in later, sooner or later. So it's uh, some async stuff and uh, as you may have inferred, I'm no JavaScript expert, but it all seemed to work. For concurrency, I, I agree, but I think we had five to 10 concurrent users and the database machine and the uh, web server just kept going without any, without any issues. More JavaScript. Uh, have All you considered right. using SSD for the database to speed up uh, data selection? Come again? Have you, have you considered uh, using SSD disk uh, for the database backend? Um, no. Uh, we had the idea to, to do that. However, we are in the uh, innovation part of this, uh, 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 innovation side of this client and uh, somehow getting SSD disk is not innovative enough. So we, we either had to, to pay by, by but, but we definitely think about it. And the point is that when you have half a terabyte of, uh, of, um, of database, you're on the limit what SSD can do and it's not very scalable uh, at, some, at some point. And uh, once we did, where are these? Other slides. Once we did this, the client was so happy that uh, he said, well, this is, this is enough for us. But especially for, uh, for the postcode retrievals. So here, the date is, are continuous, uh, but the postcode are not continuous because, uh, well, they behave a bit like geographical data. So an SSD would great, greatly help the speed of the of the application because then it's the random read random reads are basically almost free. Um, so yes, we definitely thought about that, but didn't get the money. More questions? <clears throat> Why not use WebSocket to stream data to the application? Come again. Why not use the WebSocket technology of HTML5 to stream data to the application instead of uh, an Ajax uh, API? From the database, you mean? Yes. Oh, I don't know. I just import PsychoPG and did whatever default it is. So we just connect through uh, some uh, default port. I think, it, well, the default uh, Postgres port, and I let the, the library handle it all. So it's, uh, I, I wouldn't know the, well, the underlying details of the connection. Um, I have to say that for the first phase, we did it, the, the, the web app and the database were on the same machine. So we just said to the, to the, to the app, it, it's a connection to localhost on this port, and we just let the, the, the Psycho PG do all the rest. Okay, in case there are no more questions, um, let's thank Giovanni again. And of course, you're all invited to join the panel now. See you over there.